So our program today will start with um, Fiona, who's going to be presenting. And I'm um, very honored to, to have Fiona, who uh, I've met Fiona. Gosh, where did I meet you, Fiona? I can't even remember. <laughs> I think it was maybe uh, uh, IAC. Right, okay. Um, yeah, meeting, yep. Initially, I think. <laughs> Brilliant. So, um, yeah, Fiona is an IAC member, so am I, I serve as a representative for a very strange region, Australia, New Zealand, um, South Africa, and possibly Africa. They haven't quite decided yet. Um, but yes, um, Fiona needs little introduction to, to Australia. She's spent most of her adult life working there. And um, during this time, she developed a long-standing creative, innovative and international profile within the expanded field of ceramics. Her work is increasingly experimental. It's interdisciplinary and it's collaborative. Things that we don't usually really um, associate with ceramics processes, there tends to be a real culture of sort of the master, the maker, the object. And um, we don't really have many collaborative makers. So this was one of the reasons why I wanted to invite her on. Um, and her research engages with investigation and relationships between artworks and artists, play and all its different states body and corpus in experiments where clay no longer solidifies into common everyday reality, but spins a metaphor for vaster, more fluid fabric of experience. So um, with that introduction, um, I'm going to hand over to, to uh, Fiona and um, ask everybody to please mute themselves and feel free as during her presentation to please uh, to please put questions in the question box or in the chat box. Uh, it, it's always, you, you know, afterwards when everybody wants to ask questions and you sort of, sort of feel a little bit, oh my gosh, what did, what did I have in mind? Um, what, what was that question? So tap them in, type them in as, as we go and then um, we can get the ball rolling. I'm going to hit the recording button. So everybody, if you don't want to be on camera, please uh, switch your cameras off, but it's always lovely seeing you. Um, it's, I know certainly for the presenter as well as for myself, it's, it's great seeing friends and knowing that we connected and can see each other. Um, so let's resume recording. There we go, We've, we are recording now. And um, I'm going to say over to you. And, and before I do, also thank you, Zach. Zach's been uh, my technical assistant and, and helping ceramics coach uh, through this conference. Most grateful to him for just being my second pair of eyes and somebody who, who's amazing and just keeps me on track and organized and, and helps greatly with these presentations. Thank you, Zach. Okay, Fiona. Uh, hi, so I'd, just, I'd like to um, thank um, thanks for sort of inviting me to show my work on this platform and I'd like to thank Wendy uh, with her endless enthusiasm and devotion to both training and informing um, ceramic practitioners and institutions about sustainable ceramic practices. So um, the slides aren't in any uh, chronological order. And so I'll start off um, kind of talking about like uh, how traditional ceramics, as we've been sort of more informed and we've got more awareness about with such movements as the, uh, um, the green sort of cer ceramic movement, we're becoming sort of more aware of traditional ceramics with its high energy consumption and um, toxic glazing and considerable production of waste, et cetera. Um, so by any means, it's not sort of um, environmental friendly kind of practice. So my work up to 10 years ago, 
had been sort of hard glazed kind of figurative in its expression of emotive um, psychological states. It was a mix of traditional hand building techniques with up to two or, um, two or three firings for each work. So although I don't define myself as a green artist um, in any way, my work has increasingly involved um, um, and moved away from the traditional approach. It now challenges hard, fixed definitions. And through the use of the document, photography, performance and film investigates manifestations of the uncanny, the, unshadow, um, the shadow and the ghostly with theoretical support from post-human, new feminist and new material discourses. <laughs> so this way my practice has opened up to, uh, to the virtual and the immaterial and therefore also become more interdisciplinary as well as ecological in approach and technique using different phases of clay upcycling found materials and using the byproducts of the process of the making. I want to make a visual reference to this watershed um, moment in my art that initiated the change I've just described. This slide of the survivors is the installation detail from the exhibition in 2018 uh, with performance drawer Kelly O. Dempsey and um, sound artist Mick Dick. It was titled Dirt and Ash. And, uh, and it was an interdisciplinary um, sort of performative work shortly after my PhD show in Brisbane, Australia in 2018. So this installation is significant um, in the shift in my practice towards new materialist approaches of the matter of play. Shows that remained, shows what remained after a devastating impact of a non-human agent, water, a river on my studio. This collaboration of sorts with the nature is what Barrett coins the intra-action between the artist and the object of art in the making. In her new materialist approach, the artwork is in a, in, in a constant flux of being created and creating itself in its dialogue with the artist's body challenging binary notions of agent and patient. The installation assembles what was left of my work in my studio after flooding of a local river up to two meters in my studio when I was overseas in 2018. So the flood was in April and I returned in June to face the history of work obliterated. 20 years of sketchbooks, art books, unfired work for my PhD awaited me or what was left of it. Um, it was indeed traumatic walking back into this um, ghostly space. So in its next state, the work was virtualized, um, filmed and projected onto a floating screen of about two and a half um, by five meters. It was made of slip and stripped of recycled cotton sheets, which was a perfect um, projection screen. So I don't actually have a slide of that, but um, um, this work was sort of um, sort of recycled in, in various kind of, um, through various sort of stages. So, uh, oh, next slide. The, uh, different states of clay excite me, as does the sensorial field of clay, not just the hard skinned fired objects. Unvitrified clay is free from commitment, unstable, impermanent, and full of potential a rich playground in which matter and labor interact and constitute each other in the process. After months of digesting the loss of these works and recreating a workable studio environment, I started to give more importance to and emphasis on these in-between pieces. I brought raw clay and unresolved output to the foreground and made it participant in an ongoing inquiry. This idea of the, um, so yeah, okay, this idea of, um, oh, next slide, sorry. 
Yeah. This idea of the performative and fluid nature of play led me to um, further performances, such as this one called Intravenous, that also incorporates sound work of play in all its different states, from poured slip, the pounding and slapping of clay, to vitrified high porcelain sounds. Here, my collaborators and I combined an operation combined an operation theatre with a theatre of life drawing and performance of objects. We made connections between the way you care and tender for clay and the way a patient is cared for. Hospital equipment, tubing, transporting clay slip and ink made fluid drawings on the floor of the gallery. The video performance was then projected back into the space. Okay, next video. So as you can see, this work is red, not, not very green, <laughs> but uh, the first, so this is, um, shows the work I was doing for my uh, PhD. So this is sort of the first half of my PhD investigation, which was about using technology um, and hospital Can you hear me now? Sorry. Can yes, thank you. Yes, yes, yes. Okay. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Something happened to my mute button. Okay. So I was um, transporting work uh, from an exhibition in New Zealand and I was taking it in my hand luggage and I accidentally saw the um, image on the, on the customs scanning machine. And so that's what first triggered me. Um, I also saw a show uh, when I was in Barcelona at the MENAC Museum, National Museum in, in Catalonia on, um, on scanning and the way they um, diagnose their sculptures to see what material it was made out of. And there was a whole exhibition on, on that. And that was also my, my trigger point to sort of um, engage me with, um, uh, with this world of... Um, well, sort of x-raying and seeing sort of the inside of um, my, my figures. So the material of clay has the same sort of same bone, um, same density as bone. So that when it's x-rayed, the internal landscape is revealed and traces and the fingerprints and all the imperfections are exposed. So the ex experimentation started out purely um, aesthetic but then ended up exposing a myriad of connections and possibilities. So on the left there, there is an image um, from a film made in collaboration with Grayson, filmmaker Grayson Cook. Um, here we played with the laser beam that um, hits my body and the sculpture uh, as well as a self-portrait, invoking the um, sensation of my own body being fired inside a kiln alongside my sculpture. So that's a four and a half minute film, that one on the left. And the one on the right is a digital image. Um, and the thing about digital images or taking something virtual is the fact that you can, um, it can be a miniature, you know, and you sort of photograph it and then on a wall, it becomes something very sort of large or wraps around an um, any surface or, you know, you can play with the sort of the scale when it's in the virtual realm. Uh, okay, so next, next slide, thanks. Okay, so um, this is more recent work and work that's kind of in progress. Okay, so this work is called um, The Patient. And I undertook a three month residency recently, or um, it seems recent, but it was um, July, September uh, last year at the European Ceramics Work Centre in the Netherlands. 
And so here I was sort of elaborating on previous research of the hospital environment and brought this into contact with the current impact of the corona epidemic and how that redefines our conception of the inhospitable space, life, death, hope, despair, creation, destruction, defamiliarizing us from safe and known environments. So this work was actually um, a response to patients, um, you know, um, and humanity sort of not being able to go any further, being sort of um, vitrified and um, in a bit of a hopeless sort of situation. Uh, you know, patients that die alone um, in hospitals, that was sort of a bit of the issue. My mother was sort of sick at the, sick at the time and, um, you know, in hospital with no, and she couldn't have any visitors. And it was those kind of um, concerns about um, the hospital and hospitality. And Okay, so um, here I also worked, um, I made these sort of bigger pieces like you can do when you go to residencies that have sort of big kilns and, you know, like um, originally I went there um, going to explore, ex, um, explore more the sort of potential of unfired clay, but I found myself being sort of drawn into, um, you know, and seduced by these very large kilns. And because um, of course, you know, we're always restricted by the size of the kiln. And I was like very, very seduced by that. So anyway, I ended up sort of um, mixing these hard fine pieces uh, with um a sort of a studio logic and more sort of ephemeral work so i learned um to work in a more integrated and balanced way that doesn't prime the end result but the process and material transformations that led to it so thus there is room for experimentation imperfection the castaway i'll go on to the next slide here um, the material context and the way all these engage with the artist who in the making makes herself in the conversation with the material. The resulting work has to some extent an ephemeral character as it contains different stages of clay and perishable elements but balances these elements out as integral parts of the process of making. So I think here I'm referring more to the, to the next slide but this slide was actually, um, you know, once again, using found material. These were, I remember eyeing off next door, a construction site of, um, and they were using these straps. And I went back every hour to see somebody that I could um, talk to through the fence and, and uh, <laughs> acquire these, um, these ropes. But uh, the work on the left uh, talks about uh, um, fight and surrender. So um, it, it's these things that I um, now continue to, uh, to explore in my work, the very sort of emotive and, and sometimes sort of poetic responses to sort of um, corporeal feelings. And the one on the right is actually um, was a bit of a prediction piece because it's a prosthetic arm. So I actually have just gone through a sort of um, car carpal tunnel kind of experience where that's what my arm felt like before um, for about three months afterwards <laughs> from, from moving um, so much clay around. Okay, so uh, next slide. So this was the kind of um, work I set up in the studio. We had um, a test case where it's open to the public and people come for the weekend. And I made this space quite, quite performative by um, also using sort of the byproducts, I suppose, of um, um, the studio itself. And it was quite uh, a difference between the, um, the, the hard fixed pieces and this sort of studio logic. Okay, so we'll go to the next one. Okay, so um, this, this is the last slide and it reflects some of the words that have helped me sort of um, engage with or sort of um, looks at my trajectory of 
of work. So these words, I don't know, you can see those, but um, I'll just read them out. So it's um, engaging with the fluid, unfixed, unframed, uncanny, unmeasured, patience, time, observation, material, immaterial, permeable, diverse, overlapping, byproducts, process, propositions, recycle, rehabilitate and refocus. Okay, so thanks for listening and if you'd like to look at more of my work, you can go to my website. I haven't put that up there, but it's www.fionafellart.com. And that's got a lot of the sort of films and um, sort of more, more writing about the work, I suppose, in the form of publications, etc. Okay, thank you. Thank you very oh. much, Fiona. Wonderful work. Uh, really great hearing from you. Uh, really interesting practice. Fabulous in your um, test case from EKWC. You know, the, the, the installation um, and bringing in the sort of building rubble studio detritus and creating very poetic spaces with what was never considered to be poetic materials. Um, so yeah, really, really interesting work. And um, everybody, yeah, please think, you know, jot down your questions for Fiona. We're going to move straight on to presenting Jonathan's work and then we'll have a Q&A. Anybody who's been in a Mud Matters before knows that the idea is really dialogue. I try and keep the artist presentations uh, as short as possible and concise as possible, not always easy. Um, but the aim is really for you, the audience, to, to have a dialogue around questions of sustainability, different types of practices. I always choose practices that are very different from each other to, to think through um, how we can engage with, with developing practices that, um, that consider green green questions okay so let me just with no further ado introduce um jonathan um for an american audience he's no stranger he's very well known in the home front a contemporary ceramics artist as well as an educator who allows his art to be given by instinct or be led really by instinct and experimentation he creates energetic, ambitious, and environmentally focused artwork, primarily using reclaimed and sustainable materials. An Ohio native, Jonathan Mess holds a BFA from the University of Montana, Missoula, which is actually where one of our key Green Task Force uh, members teaches. And I don't know if you knew her, jo uh, Jonathan, Julia Galloway, I, I, I've met her before when I was at SUNY New Pulse, but okay. she was not there when I was at Montana. Okay, excellent. So um, Jonathan has, yes, an MFA from, in ceramics from SUNY, the State University of New York at New Pulse. And he's been teaching visual arts with a focus on ceramics for two decades. He's received numerous grants and awards, his works in private collections, and he's been exhibited internationally. He resides and currently teaches in Midcoast, Maine. And um, just before before we go, we start Jonathan's presentation. We had a little uh, chat before and and spoke about the serendipity of the two artists' names, Fiona <laughs> Fell and Jonathan Mess, and how wonderfully appropriate they were. And I've been thinking about it. I actually couldn't think of more appropriate names for artists and, and there was no intention. It was just purely, purely serendipitous. So, yes. Mm. Okay, over to you, Jonathan. Um, Caroline, would you mind muting yourself? Caroline Mayher. She has, yeah. Yes, we got 
we have to figure out where uh, where we're gonna open our uh, our fell mess gallery. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, exactly. Thank you so much, Wendy, for inviting me to speak um, about my work. It's truly an honor, and I appreciate all you've done for us. Um, and Fiona, it's also really exciting to learn more about your work. I, I look forward to digging in a little bit after this. And thank you, Zach, for managing the technical stuff. We all need the Zachs in our lives these days. Um, so I'm Jonathan Mess. Um, hi, everybody. I'm a ceramic artist and educator in Maine. And that's the northeasternmost coast of the U.S. Next slide, please. If you look back at my work over the past 20 plus years, you'll see a lot of variety. Just as, I've, just as I have changed and grown as a human, so is my work. If you look closely, you'll see a common thread throughout all of my work. Early on, way back in the early 1990s, I made a rule for myself. Find everything and pay for nothing. I was definitely influenced by my grandfather, who was a child of the Great Depression. He and they saved absolutely everything. He made most everything himself. Um, he was green before green was a thing, right? So I grew up finding and making things too. I've always had trouble buying art materials, many of which are mined or manufactured somewhere overseas and sent via some fossil fuel burning machine, all to feed my art addiction. So I go other routes whenever I can. I scavenge, dumpster dive, drag stuff out of the woods. I'll hit junkyards. I always ask around, stash and store stuff for later. I love a good score. And there's so much waste in this world and it's there for the taking. So I love stuff, but don't get me wrong. I love stuff like everybody else. There's something in all of us that must gather. But I think we've lost some of our hunter instincts. If I can work a bit harder to find materials, willing to get a little dirty, I can get them for free, give them a new life, save them from the landfill, and it gives myself permission to use them wildly without remorse. Next slide, please. Found objects are really beautiful. They, they have inherent stories, histories, pasts. The materials are already loaded with content, sometimes obvious, sometimes deep in the layers. I just recontextualize them. I give them a new life, a recycle, upcycle, re-art, rebirth, whatever we want to do with it. Next slide, please. So in 2006, I went back to grad school, or I went to grad school at, for ceramics at SUNY New Paltz, and that's in New York, about an hour north of the city. I was hired as a clay maker. So I was managing the, the studio's reclaimed clay. And through this job, I saw, I saw how much waste was being made. I had to figure out a way to use it. Not just the reclaimed clay, but I also wanted to figure out what to do with all the buckets that had been shoved in the corner for decades and the piles of broken, unsuccessful fired work. So I started collecting all these materials and testing them to determine firing temps and how I could use them. I made molds out of cardboard boxes and began combining all these materials and layers, slowly filling them up, adding other artists' scraps and materials, essentially making landforms. I had to clean out the sink traps as part of my studio job, and I even added that nasty stuff into the mix. I made over 40 of these reclaimed sculptures, and I showed them in their raw form for my thesis show. I let them dry for months before the firing, knowing that this was a risky way to make. Next slide, please, Zach. When I finally fired them, I was disappointed because the kiln fired hotter than I initially intended. And the material slumped and oozed. It took a little time, but I shifted my mindset and realized that these forms are actually more interesting than I originally had envisioned. I've since learned that this is a crucial part of working with mystery, with mystery materials. I have to embrace risk, unknowns, constantly redefine failure, and consider my work in new ways. Next slide. As I unwrapped the cardboard box molds from my pieces, I found another happy accident. They absorbed the layered color and made beautiful unintended landscapes. Rather than discard the cardboard, I realized they were artworks themselves and I began to show these clay prints as well. I showed my best landfills for a while 
And then I began thinking about the less interesting ones that I never selected to show. I wanted to slice them open, which had actually been my original plan as I made them. I used industrial stone cutting saws to slice them open into cross sections. And I, I wanted to reinvent my undesirable and broken work. A few years later, in 2013, I was itching to make a body of new reclaimed work. I'm lucky to live near Watershed Center for the Ceramic Arts here in the mid coast of Maine. It's an old brick factory turned into a ceramic residency center. They're more than happy to give me their waste clay of old buckets and, that were stashed out back. Materials like these are full of heavy metals. It's actually illegal to throw them out or to dump them as they will leach into the water table. You either have to pay to have them legally disposed of or you end up with a collection of mystery buckets behind the barn. These have been sitting here for decades. So they love it when I show up every few years and make use of their waste. I started testing them to see what I had to work with, checking for color and consistency, organizing glossy, matte, crumbly, puffy, melty, bubbly, etc. This time, I manipulated the cardboard forms, ready to embrace blowouts and mistakes as I filled them. I poured wet, my wet, whipped up reclaimed clay between glazed layers, dried clay chunks, newspaper, bricks, broken shards of pots, people's leftovers. It was a time capsule of the moment. I made over 70 reclaimed sculptures. Again, I slowly dried the work for months and then fired them. Sometimes I hit it right and they were beautiful right out of the kiln. For me, they became irreverent abstract landscapes. This group of work went to my first solo show in New York City at Greenwich House Pottery. Others I later cross-sectioned, looking for new ways to reinvent them. I let myself play, cutting lines into the surface, reminding me of blast lines and rock faces, always thinking about natural versus man-made landforms I see around me. Now I always try and find ways to invent my scraps, broken, failed work, and waste. So just before the pandemic, I had this unexpected opportunity. I got a, I got a call from, a, from a, an ad agency representing Seventh Generation, the eco-cleaning products company who was owned by Unilever. They wanted to hire me to come out to Las Vegas to create an artivist event for a campaign called Generate Change in their booth at an international cleaning convention. So my work at a cleaning convention in Vegas, I had my reservations clearly. I was not sure if this was the right fit. I was nervous and this was way out of my comfort zone. But sometimes you just have to see where art takes you. So I did my research. And according to their websites, Seventh Generation produces a focus on sustainability and their conservation of natural resources. They use recycled and post-consumer materials in their packaging. They use biodegradable and plant-based plant phosphate and chlorine-free ingredients in all their products. Unilever, who owns them, sources all their agricultural raw materials sustainably. Their sites across five continents now are powered by 100% renewable grid electricity. 100% of their plastic packaging will be reusable, recyclable, or compostable by 2025. So the word corporation always, you know, isn't, isn't, doesn't sit well with me, but I'm cool with working with a corporation like Seventh Generation and Unilever. They seem to be making the right decisions, environmentally speaking. Because here's the thing, I myself can, can work to green my ceramic practice and my, and my teaching. I can recycle all the bottles and cans I'm able to. We can compost every scrap of food. I can try not to buy plastic, yet I'm a tiny drop in the bucket. Corporations are the ones that deal with billions of pounds of waste around the world daily. They are the ones who can make the big changes in their decisions. So I came up with a plan to make some protest signs, the kind you would see held up at a rally. I wanted there to be a transformation and have a reveal at the end. It would be a performance and I was on display. So upon arrival, I hit Clay Arts Vegas. It's, the, it's a local pottery and studio in town. They were super kind and interested in helping me out. 
they hooked me up with a bunch of their waste clay. I cleaned some stuff out of their sink and I, I, they gave me buckets and tools to borrow. I love that um, sharing within the ceramic community. So this convention that I was hired to, to work at um, attracted around 20,000 attendees, lots of suits. It was clean, crisp, and corporate. And then there's this guy, Mess, in booth 2127. I action painted with my colored clay slip all day. It was a conversation starter. My goal was to talk to people about the environment and think about how their products and packaging affect the planet and our future. I dried the work with fans overnight and hung them up the next day to begin the slow peel and reveal while I answered questions. The clay surfaces dried and cracked like the earth. Colorants stained the paper and the reveal created excitement. When it was all said and done, I, th I think I did some good. I'm usually not so direct with my content. I'm not used to using words in my work, but I pushed myself, I went for it, and I'm excited to have infiltrated the corporate world with my unorthodox ways. But I gotta tell you, after all that, I sit here a hypocrite. I mean, I flew there, I drive a car, I'm ashamed of how easy it is I live with, while so many others around the world can't even find clean water. Are my efforts worthy? I question myself all the time. I want to do my best to fight for what I believe so we have a planet to pass on to our next generation. Clay is my skill, it's my platform, my voice. I have to do something and I have to try. Thank you. Wow, thank you, Jonathan. What an amazing presentation. I just I would love everybody just to unmute and clap. I mean, that was so inspiring. Um, yeah, Liz, everybody, just thank you, thank you, thank you. You can do a virtual clap. That was really totally inspiring. And um, so many, so many interesting things to to respond to. Um, and perhaps the the first question or, or comment um, to your to your proposal or your, your presentation is your acknowledgement of the importance of top-down change as well as bottom-up change. And uh, I applaud you. I applaud you for that because that is it's very easy to get disheartened and feel that taking small steps makes little change but particularly in your instance where you're a teacher and we are all teachers to our families we all have have we all leaders um, in our community and those communities may be bigger or smaller but we're all leaders and making small changes and sharing those small changes um, and taking bigger risks as in your case pushing your practice forward um, in unconventional ways is about leading this community and, and taking on board the importance of um, climate change and privilege, um, our privilege within the West to have easy access to, to materials uh, just on hand, um, etc. So um, I'm gonna look at the chat box and if anybody has got any questions, um, you're welcome to unmute yourself. I'd love this to be an open dialogue. Um, there's a lot of messages saying thank you and congratulating you both. Beautiful presentations, um, inspiring. Thanks so much, Jonathan. That was really interesting. Thanks, um, Daddy Mess, for being here. It's wonderful to have you here. It's, it's so important to su support um, each other. Uh, no, no questions. Um, anybody? Please feel free to unmute yourself um, and introduce yourself and your question. Liz? Liz Duarte? You unmuted? Do you want to? Oh, sorry. I, no. I, uh, I didn't realize I was unmuted. Um, Do you have a question? Um, no, I just, I, I, uh, I don't know if I, I necessarily have a question, but I just really identify with a lot of the, the work that, that you did, Jonathan, I, that's, it's really awesome. It's a, a lot of things that I've, that I've thought about doing, um, 
as a lab tech in the studio and dealing with all that craziness, but just, just the idea of, of it being um, an opportunity, I think is a really fabulous way to ap approach um, the material um, and, and the waste and, and kind of thinking about the idea of um, a lot of, of what I've been thinking about lately is not, not necessarily sustainability, but like it, evolving these ideas around waste, which I, is, is what you're, you're doing. Uh, really approaching it differently. Certainly within the design community, we see waste as a very precious resource and um, landfills are, are, you know, treasure trove. Tracy, can you mute yourself, please? Tracy Terry, thank you. Um, and yeah, we do need to change our attitudes towards waste and uh, dumpster diving. What a wonderful phrase. Who came up with that, Jonathan? I, I don't know. We, that's something I think I've, we've said for a long time. I think it's something people say in the States, go dumpster diving. <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant. I didn't know that one. Awesome. Okay, questions. Thank, thank you, Liz, for the comments. Thank you. Amy Lee says, how do you suggest we individually take action to curb thinking around sustainability of materials we use in our practice, particularly as it applies to new, to those new to the materials. So how do you, uh, yeah, think about sustainability um, and materials? Do you want to both answer that? Perhaps you first, Fiona, and then you, Jonathan? Are you muted, Fiona, or jo muted. Jonathan, you go there first. There we go. Oh, no, there we go. Okay. Um, yeah, so for me, I, um, I think it's, um, it's about those different formats that don't have, you know, that, that um, it's about sort of documenting and photographing and sort of filming and how you can take the material into the immaterial and what we can do with that. Um, so I think that's, um, how I'd approach where, which question are we? I was sort of floating off. Okay. I actually missed one. So, so sorry, oh. that was the question from Amy Lee. Okay. Um, so how do you suggest we individually take action, action to curb thinking, uh, to curb thinking around sustainability of materials mm -hmm. we use in our practice? I, I think one of them is, um, you know, thinking about scale as well you know now like I, I've sort of considered that why not why don't I make something very small and, and rather than something very big you know and photograph that and sort of film it and make it make it like I want to make it by transforming it through different kind of mediums I suppose but also mm -hmm. consider if, if that if I really do want to fix that piece if I really do need to fire it um or would it be better a drawing of it or would it be better a photograph of it, you know? Yes, mm. yes. So immaterial, immaterializing your practice, creating scales through other means, um, transforming, you know, not necessarily firing something we spoke about yesterday, only firing your best and what is your best. Um, whatever you're going to fire will be here for at least 30,000 years it will outlast you know you your grandchildren your great-grandchildren do we really need to be making more landfill for Jonathan to dumpster dive and reclaim <laughs> and refire in in you know 20,000 years uh we can yeah, what what is the the point to endlessly creating more objects that do not necessarily um what contribute to to our civilization in a very meaningful way um, and certainly your poetic installations that speak about sort of this fall and humanity and agency between bodies and um, this, this very interesting relationship art and science and medicine is 
which is augmented through the non-material is, is, a, is a really exciting avenue um, for, for artists to think about their practice and, and take their practice into new spaces. So thank you for sharing that. Jonathan, do you want to do you answer that, the question about sustainability? Sure, sure. I think um, you have in many ways. <laughs> yeah, well, as a teacher, I think, and I'm sure there's a lot of teachers out there or people that work in studios. I mean, it's, I teach high school. So I, I literally like day one will bring out the clay and be like, I bought this, you know, and, and walk them through like, I bought this from a pot, you know, and it was shipped here. And that's why, you know, we don't throw it in the trash can if it's something breaks, you know, and I, and I tell them how much this box of clay costs and how it was vacuum pug and mix at a factory and probably half the materials came from California, some came from China, so, and just kind of like blow their mind a little bit that how much energy and, and resources, you know, happened to just for us to make, you know, this cool trinket, you know, so and that's, and then I walk them through the process of reclaiming and I make sure every kid's got to mix up the slot bucket every once in a while and like dig out the clay. Um, so I think like really, you know, it's education, like anything else, you know, it's education, showing them where things come from, talking about it with people and then in, in incorporating all those things that m probably most studios are doing now, but always pushing like having a sink trap, saving material, you know, saving materials, having a reclaim bin, um, it, it does shock me because, you know, I'm, I'm now known around here as the guy that'll take anything and just how many people in the pottery world, you know, the ceramic world, they, you know, it just speaks to our, our, the way we are as humans. Like we want something to be perfect. So we buy that perfect clay and it has a brand name. It's vanilla ice clay from, you know, and it's very smooth and perfect. And um, it has, you know, and it's all like manufactured and packaged. Whereas, you know, you can dig clay right out of the ground to work with. Um, there's, there's so much that's, like I said, free and available. So I think just finding resources and thinking about how you can reinvent, you know, what's already wasted and reused. Like what I was, like Liz was saying, you know, just being in that back studio and seeing how much waste, it's, a, it's an opportunity to be an opportunistic person, I think is the key. Opportunism, opportunistic. <laughs> Wonderful, thank you. Um, lots of lovely questions coming in. So um, Julian would love to know from Jonathan how much testing you did versus uh, merely layering the different clay, clay elements um, right. and rushing in and hoping that the stuff will, <laughs> will, like, will like major melting or explosions won't happen. Right. Yeah, I, I test, you know, when I'm dealing with something that I'm not sure, you got to test it. So I definitely, you know, try and test everything. But, you know, in ceramics, the more you play, you get this material knowledge. So you understand what things are pretty much going to do. But I do mix low fire, higher fire, you know, mid range, everything together, slips, glazes, and I've learned, you know, how to play somewhat safely. But I don't like to keep it too safe. I also... I'm very lucky, like I said, I live near that watershed ceramic center. Um, and at the time, like that last, that last group of work, you know, they had an old kiln that they were gonna decim you know, take down in the fall. And I kind of got permission to be okay if something spills or breaks. And that's another thing. I mean, you can we go online here. There's so many people that are giving away free kilns um, that you could, you know, push to their limits a little bit more creatively, or there's a lot of ways to, you know, I'll build up walls in case something spills so yeah. that it has a reservoir to, 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 to melt into. Um, so there's a lot of ways you can play with a lot of risk, but also keep it safe. But I've definitely have had some uh-ohs and some accidents that cost me money and time. Um, one time a piece slumped over right into an electric kiln and just melted down the wall. So that was, not a, that was not a good day, but that, that work is actually pretty exciting now. So, <laughs> yes, absolutely. Um, Lorraine Thomas has a question for Fiona, um, uh, saying, Fiona, I'm interested in hearing more about your hospital residency and how that came about. Um, did she embed interviews or conversations in her practice? 
Okay, so so the the residency I did, uh, the the research um, stint that I had was at um, Manac in in Barcelona, the Rest Restoration and Conservation um, Center. That was with the X ray equipment for the sculptures. But uh, my interest in hospitals was my my mother was a nurse at a hospital, a matron of a hospital for sort of forty years or so. So that was my first engagement with it. Like as a child, I grew up in that environment being left up, you know, after school, I'd be um, left at the hospital waiting for my mother to finish her shift, being passed around from hospital bed to hospital bed, sort of entertaining kind of patients that um, didn't have visitors for the day. Um, so I think I've got a sort of deep relationship with this hospital environment and this sort of clinical environment. And then when I started sort of x-raying my work in hospitals, um, um, that was through sort of somebody I knew I got sort of permission, sort of research permission to, to do the sort of x-raying and the CCT sort of scans. Yeah, that was, um, I didn't do interviews or, or sort of case studies, but it became a kind of a bit of a, bit of a performative act in itself. I had to sort of bring the sculptures through on wheelchairs, you know, like um, the, the figures sort of covered up and uh, go in the waiting room with them. And, you know, it was very, very sort of strange um, kind of performative act actually doing the, doing the procedures. Mm. Fabulous. And um, Fiona, do you want to talk a little bit more about the way you reinvented your practice? Um, ooh, yes, well, I sort of said the question, you know, like how mm. many objects that I actually had, I suppose, how many, you know, things I had sort of made over the years that happened through having to either move studios. And as you know, sort of studios, sometimes studio spaces are just storage spaces, you know, in some people's case, they need a studio because they need to store all of their objects. And everything that they've made over sort of you know 20 30 years or something so it becomes a storage space um uh, that is so I was sort of questioning that thing of sort of even um you know the material aspect of things so how um i had a, a, a clay supply um uh, the the shop owner for this clay supply place said that life was about moving one molecule from molecules from one place to another <laughs> <laughs> and um, I, it was my first studio in this ceramic supply shop you know just beside it it was fantastic I actually learned my clay knowledge from there rather than art school where yeah um, I used to ask him um, you know mm -hmm. look at look at some sort of chemi chemical or ceramic component and go oh what's that Bill you know, and he'd say exactly what it was for. And yeah, but that um, moving molecules from one place to another, I yeah. think, yeah, that's the thing about sort of traveling and, you know, sometimes, mm -hmm. yeah, it's good to take a break from those sort of spaces and have your studio in your head for a while. Sure, sure. Thank you, Fiona. Um, there's a lovely question from Lee, and it, she says, with regards to unfired clay, how does one educate the public that unfired clay objects are of value and do you think unfired clay have a market? Lee I'd like to invite you to or I'd almost insist that you attend Carla Garcia's presentation on Saturday. She'll be giving a 20-minute presentation at midday eastern time if I recall correctly but please check my Instagram bio link with all my ceramics coach website there's a list of the Nsika events um, we're having one pretty much every day of the NSICA conference and Carla Garcia has currently got this a really major exhibition on of raw clay sculptures and um, raw clay paintings. So ask her. I know she's sold very well. And um, that question probably can also be asked or tackled a little bit by Fiona. How do you sell your dematerialized works, um, what is the market like? And can you tell us a little bit about your experience, Fiona? Well, um, the shows that I've actually uh, been able to explore the unfired work in, works in have been 
Um, it was actually a, a PhD show. And as you know, for those shows, you've got a lot of sort of license. It's not sort of commercial in any way. Um, also with um, regional galleries where you get an artist fee, for example, to put on an exhibition. Um, and then later on, it has a more, um, you know, through um, through videos or through sort of photographic photographs of the work itself or the, the film. I've um, participated in uh, lots of film festivals um, in different places. It's a, it's quite a, a delight after walking, um, you know, working with clay and um, the heaviness of it and being having to transport it to just actually um, send something on, you know, we transfer to a film festival in London or something, you know. So that's a, there's a there's something fantastic about that. But as far as um, I had to you know, a com commercial gallery in Australia for about 15 years, um, you know, where I made my past work, but my figurative work. And at the same time, when I was doing this e exploration, um, the, the gallery actually um, closed. They were the longest running um, commercial gallery in Australia and they, um, the owners uh, died. <laughs> And so the gallery closed and it actually gave me sort of um, freedom to explore these other, you know, these other sort of um, formats and platforms. Yeah. So when one door opens, another one, one door closed, another open for you. That's amazing. And the same with your studio. When your studio was uh, taken by flood damage, you, you were liberated from a lot of clutter and detritus and could refigure your practice, even though, you know, it was, a, it was a disaster and terribly traumatic, I imagine, with a PhD thesis coming up um, to lose your, your entire studio. But, but from that, you know, arose this new practice for you, which um, is far greener, far lighter, and, and perhaps gives you more space to be creative. True, yeah. And it, I mean, it freed me and I, now I moved countries. I moved from Australia and I live in Barcelona in Spain now and without I mean perhaps without the flood I would have been too attached to my objecthood and never be able to leave it. <laughs> <laughs> Great okay um, a question for Jonathan do you always draw your pieces for months? I do well you know, it depends so I've, I've mostly worked site specifically. Um, I'm down in my basement right now, which is pretty much a, a, you know, like anybody else's basement, but I have a little gallery in the corner. I don't necessarily work here. I work, I'll bring stuff here to cut and to display, but I work out at places where I'm typically a seasonal person. So I teach, you know, and when summer comes, that's when I make. So naturally I that cycle of, summer I get the drying process in the fall when it cools down when I can fire um the work is so you know the works I've been making some of that work is so thick and heavy I mean everybody in ceramics knows you know when you first learn they tell you you can't fire something that's solid you know you're always having to hold or make things thinner but um you know like all good artists we all break the rules and I'm just breaking them you know in a big way so they're really thick and heavy and dense and they're full of all kinds of nasty wet stuff. So I really have to dry them for a long time. And um, I'll, I try and get them in the sun if I can. I put fans on them. Um, and up here in the Northeast of the US, it's all about like, you know, August, July, August and September, those dry months. So I can dry them out. And then, like I said, I try and fire once it cools down in October. Um, so months, yes, it takes months. <laughs> wow that's amazing so so that your work you know is almost well is in tune with the the seasons as well sort of the seasons of your life professional seasons as well as um environmental and uh, climatic seasons correct and i'm always trying to dial in and hone in on that it's not always easy as life as you everybody knows life will you know throw curveballs at you like pandemics um but yes i am always trying to follow those seasons. Marvellous. Well, thank you. And I, I think that's perhaps a really wonderful way to, to end off um, and say that, you know, I think COVID has 
has opened a new season for us and has opened new opportunities and new ways of thinking about our practices, new ways of communicating, new ways of working. And um, yeah, you know, it's Viva Le Le Vert, long live green. And, and let's use this opportunity to dematerialize and rematerialize and reconfigure our practices so that we um, are environmentally engaged and conscious and taking um, our responsibility as artists and citizens very seriously and making that difference. So I want to thank everybody, to thank um, you both, particularly from my heart. Thank you, Jonathan, and thank you, Fiona. Thank, thank you. you to our audience for being here with us today and for sharing um, in these amazing presentations and for the, the wonderful privilege of seeing you, Jonathan, in your gallery space. Um, such a treat to see these beautiful works. It's, um, it's been a real privilege to, to have both of you share with us. Thank you so much, um, everybody. For those who don't know, Mud Matters is a monthly uh, webinar that I offer as part of my ceramics coach portfolio and um, also to support my work within um, Clean Green Ceramics. If you missed the presentation yesterday, please don't hesitate to go look at uh, the website cleangreenceramics.com and, and ceramics coach is www.ceramicscoach.com. If you want links to any of our upcoming events, especially the, the link to Carla Garcia, there is one in the chat. Um, there are also all the links to upcoming presentations that Ceramics Coach is organizing are on my Instagram bio. What have I forgotten? <laughs> I can't think of anything else just to say thank you guys. Thank you, everybody. And um, Oh, yes. Uh, if you missed any of them, um, they are, everything is uh, recorded and I put them up on my YouTube channel. The one from yesterday, you can get the link to YouTube. Also on my Instagram bio, there is a link to yesterday's um, greening environment, green practices. So that, that is also available on my Instagram. There's just hit that link tree link and you will find that. Um, and within the next couple of hours, I'll also be putting this presentation up on my YouTube channel and putting a link to that on my link tree. So you'll be able to just easy access that through, um, through my Instagram bio, or if you prefer to browse it on your computer, ceramicscoach.com under podcasts. I put all my lectures and podcasts. So there are also links on ceramicscoach.com um, for watching it on the bigger screen. So Thank you, thank you, thank you, Jonathan. Thank you, Fiona. And guys, let's keep greening the planet together. Go green and let's make a difference. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thanks, Alison. Thank you. Lovely <laughs> seeing everybody. Okay, awesome. I'm going to end this and, and say, see you guys next month. I'll be announcing the next Mud Matters the next week or so on, well, as soon as I've caught my breath off in Sika. Please pop by Ceramic Studio booth if you're in Ettenseeker. If not, join our events. They're all free and open to the public. Awesome. Okay, brilliant. Thank you so much and all the best, everybody.